Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Joe Kent, uh, the Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute. And um, today we're talking about the Jones Act. Um, Kelly Iakina, the president of the Grassroot Institute, uh, couldn't be here today, but he uh, sends you his fond aloha. And uh, today's presentation is being recorded. It will be broadcast on Akaku Public Access. We'll do that um, a few times to make sure that everyone can hear this presentation. And it'll be available on YouTube as well. Um, and if you'd like to get that, you can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. That's grassrootinstitute.org. So um, thanks so much for being here. Um, again, my name is Joe Kent. We've got Sean Mitsui. He's our development director at the Grassroot Inst I mean, excuse me, finance director at Grassroot Institute. And my assistant, Melissa Rabideau, is here with us as well from the Grassroot Institute. Um, and today, again... We're talking about the Jones Act. It's a hot topic. Inflation, the war in Ukraine, cost of living in Hawaii. These are all big topics right now. And the Jones Act is a part of all that. Um, as you know, the Jones Act says that um, only U.S. ships can bring goods from one U.S. port to another U.S. port. So like from Los Angeles to Hawaii. And that makes the cost of living in Hawaii more. Um, but I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of debate. There's two sides to the coin on this issue. There are a lot of shipping, um, pro shipping interests who favor the Jones Act, who promote the Jones Act. And um, we invited those interests here. But uh, somehow, whenever the event gets closer, um, they they go away. So it's hard to get them here. We have a chair right over there just in case one of them pops in and we can, we wanted to make it more of a debate. But anyways, I'm going to ask a lot of the questions that they would have asked or a lot of the questions that they typically do ask. Now today we have with us Colin Graybow. Let's give him a round of applause. He's one of the nation's top Jones Act scholars and one of the folks uh, from Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. He's also a Grassroots Institute scholar. And we learned a lot from him about the Jones Act. Um, there are a lot of people in Washington, actually, who wanted to try him for treason for talking about the Jones Act. <laughs> uh, but we have, you know, free speech in this country, so we can't do that. Um, Colin is a research fellow at the Cato Institute's Herbert A. Stifel Center for Trade Policy Studies, where he focuses on trade protectionism. Oh, What's that? Is that me? Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought that was me. He has a master's degree in international trade and investment policy from George Washington University. And he's also, again, a grassroots scholar. And he helps us a lot with the Jones Act issue. So um, today we're going to interview, basically interview Colin together. And there's going to be a time for Q&A at the end. So um, one more round of applause for Colin, please. And... And I want to start again by just, um, we want to start with a 101 course, a crash session to explain what the Jones Act is. And then after that, we're going to go to a 201 course to talk about some of the main arguments about the Jones Act. And uh, we'll hear about that. But first, what is the Jones Act for those in the audience that might not know? And how does it work? Well, thank you, everyone. Aloha. Uh, the Jones Act is Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. It says that if you want to move cargo from one point in the United States to another over water, you have to use a vessel that is U.S. flagged and registered as opposed to another country. It has to be built in the United States. It has to be crewed mostly by Americans and owned mostly by Americans, at least 75% U.S. owned. Okay, and so just a quiz. I'm going to do a quiz here with the audience. Oh, oh uh, actually, let's see if I can switch mics with you. Okay, one, two. Does that? Gotcha. Okay, yeah, keep it close to your okay. mouth so All we right. can hear you. Um, so if a ship from Shanghai, foreign ship from Shanghai, brought goods to Hawaii, is that allowed? Everyone, is that allowed? It is allowed. It is allowed, actually. 
Um, why is that allowed? Because it's a foreign ship. It's international. It's between the Jones Act applies to domestic shipments from one U.S. port to another U.S. port. So, so that's international. So, what about a foreign ship brings goods to Hawaii and then goes to L.A.? Is that allowed? Everyone, is that allowed? Yes or no? What do you think? The answer is it depends. The foreign ship can come to Hawaii and drop off goods that came from abroad, and it can continue on to Los Angeles and drop off other goods that also originate in China. What it cannot do is pick up goods in Hawaii and then transport those goods to, to California. Okay, one more. <laughs> A foreign ship goes to L.A., picks up goods, brings them to Hawaii and drops them off in Hawaii. Is that allowed? No. Right? Right. <laughs> and that's because of the Jones Act. So now we all know kind of how the Jones Act works here in Hawaii. But I wanted to talk about, we, we invited um, the head of uh, Matts, or excuse me, one of the heads of Matson, Kuahaku Park, the president of the American Maritime Partnership, which is the nation's premier Jones Act lobby group, to attend this. Um, unfortunately, he never responded. And re- we... Uh, invited many other Jones Act proponents here. And again, that chair is for them, <laughs> but uh, they, weren't, they weren't here. If they happen to walk through the room though, please usher them to the chair. But I'm gonna ask a few questions that they would have asked. So the main argument for the Jones Act is national defense, right? We need the Jones Act to protect our military. So um, if the Jones Act were repealed, then military campaigns would be serviced by foreign entities. So how do you respond to that? So to elaborate on this point, how national security figures into the Jones Act, the logic behind the Jones Act is by requiring U.S. ships, that we have a pool of ships that the military can draw from in time of war that can transport goods and supplies for the military to where it's needed. The U.S. crew requirement means that we have mariners, American mariners, that can crew these ships, so we have to rely on foreigners. And the U.S. built requirement means, theoretically, that we have shipyards that can build or repair ships damaged uh, in, in battle. Uh, obvious military applications there. The problem with this logic is it doesn't work. Uh, these, the, these goals are laudable. By all means, absolutely, the military should have what it needs to do its job. They should have the ships. They should have mariners. And they, of course, should have shipyards to repair them. But if we look at each one of these categories, the Jones Act is failing. Oh, uh, can you put the mic even Sorry. closer to your okay. mouth? Yeah. Um, we start off with ships. Over time, the Jones Act fleet has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. As recently as 1980, there were 257 Jones Act ships. Today, there are 93. So this fleet is more than halved in the last 40 years. We look at the number of mariners. We have fewer ships. That means you have fewer mariners. There was a government report done uh, five years ago, a maritime working group that concluded in the event of a sustained sea lift campaign, the military would be at least 1,800 mariners short of what's needed to crew the U.S. fleet. And then we look at shipbuilding. Uh, according to the numbers I've, I've, I've encountered in my research over the last 20 years, uh, in an average year, Jones Act U.S. shipyards build three ocean-going commercial ships per year. To put that number in, compare, in context, a single shipyard in South Korea can build 60 ships or more in a year. And we're stuck with three. Last year, there were zero Jones Act ships delivered. So far this year, there's been one. There's supposed to be one more delivered for Pesha. Uh, that was supposed to be delivered two years ago, and they still haven't delivered it. They say Q4 2022. We're we'll running out of time. We'll see. Um, next year, if that ship isn't delivered, again, we'll be at zero. So that's where we're at with shipbuilding in this country. And the few ships that are built are highly reliant on foreign components to build them. And they say American built. What does that really mean? Because a lot of the components to build these ships, they come from South Korea. Uh, for example, one uh, type of tanker built in 2006, I believe, each one of those ships required 500 containers from South Korea were brought over, as well as 25 shipments of bulk components like the engine, the propeller, things that make the ship actually work. And the U.S. shipyard just takes those and they do a lot of assembly work. That's, that's what they do. So this notion that Jones Act frees us from foreign reliance on shipbuilding is an illusion. Okay, but what about the military aspect of that? Okay, so we, um, let's say we get in a conflict overseas and now we have to ship 
goods to help service that conflict, those would presumably be done on Jones Act ships? Absolutely not. Uh, very rarely are they done on Jones Act ships. Um, and, and that makes sense. If you look over history, the Persian Gulf War, for example, there was only one ship that was taken from domestic trade, from Jones Act uh, trade in the United States, and used to transport goods, uh, supplies for the military to Saudi Arabia. In Operation Iraqi Freedom, I've only found, again, one Jones Act ship that was pulled out of trade uh, to support military needs. And this makes sense. Because if you take out Jones Act ships, well, who's going to take goods to Hawaii or Puerto Rico or Alaska or these other places? In fact, the head of U.S. Transportation Command last year in testimony for Congress was asked about the reliance on Jones Act ships. And he said, I'm going to paraphrase here, he said, in wargaming, we've concluded that we would not want to rely on Jones Act ships uh, to undermine their their, their economic um, viability. So we don't we don't really use Jones Act ships. In other, we do in, use- in other words, if if we pulled the Jones Act ships out of the market, then who's serving Hawaii? Exactly, exactly. Okay. So it's, it's very difficult to do. Uh, so what the military does, the primary means of commercial shipping are not Jones Act ships. They are U.S. flagged non-Jones Act ships. What that means, these are American flagged ships that are foreign built. So they violate the Jones Act. So these are ships that can transport goods internationally but despite having an American flag and being crewed by Americans, it's illegal for them to transport goods in the United States, the country in which they are flagged. So, wait, so you're saying that uh, in my scenario, um, we do a military conflict overseas. We need to support that with goods. The ships that we use today to, to service that are not Jones Act ships. Exactly. And, um, and why is that? That, so the the military has something called the uh, Maritime Security Program. This is basically a subsidy given to 60 ships. They're paid $5.3 million per year, I believe. And basically, in exchange for that, the military has the right to use those ships in time of war or national emergency. So my attitude is, by all means, the military should have what it needs to do its job. And if they need more ships, then let's increase those subsidies uh, so they can have what they need to do the job. I'll add one other point. The virtue of subsidies, not only is the cost transparent, we can all see how much it costs and we see what we get. You know, roughly $300 million gets you 60 ships. Um, but it's fair. It's fair. Under the Jones Act, the logic is, well, people that use ships are those that are paying for these ships. Um, so Hawaii, if this is national security meant to benefit all Americans, why are the non-contiguous states and territories disproportionately funding this? You know, in the mainland, people don't really rely on ships. You know, we have trucks, we have trains, we have other forms of transportation. But this is national security for all Americans. Why is Puerto Rico and Hawaii and Guam and Alaska footing a disproportionate part of the bill. It's just, it's, it's, so there's a fairness aspect and effectiveness aspect. So I want to just do an audience check here. Um, are you able to hear clearly? Are we talking too fast or anything like that? Okay. just want to make sure. So, okay, good. Um, yes. Okay. I'm told that they can hear me really well. So for you, try to be crystal clear and speak right into that mic. (laughs) Um, one more on the military. Yeah. China. China um, it has been said to be a huge threat worldwide and to the United States. And if the Jones Act were repealed or reformed, that would somehow disrupt the military's, um, the Jones Act's ability to assist in military operations. And we would be, have those um, goods being brought by Chinese companies or foreign entities. Is that safe? I mean, so this is the argument. Yeah, this is a confusing argument, to be frank. Um, you know, my attitude is, if we want to avoid reliance on China, if we want to uh, ensure that there are American flagships out there available for the military, then by all means, let's fund them. Again, I have no problem with direct subsidies to ensure that the military has American flagships, if that's what our goal is. What I know is right now with the Jones Act, we have a system that does not work. We have a smaller fleet um, that uh, we don't have the mariners, so it's not working. And while we're talking about China, let's keep in mind that while Jones Act advocates and these shipping companies say we need the Jones Act to stave off China because we're worried about China, where do these guys send their ships to get repaired? China. Pull out your phone right now. Look at VesselTracker.com. Type in Horizon Reliance. It's a Pacia ship. It's sitting right now on the Yangtze River in Nantong, China, being repaired. They're putting a new engine in this 42-year-old ship so they can keep it going to at least you know 50 years. In a non-Jones Act world, this ship would have been scrapped long ago, replaced with something far more modern. 
Uh, I have a photo of uh, Matson Executives in Nantong, China, at the Costco shipyard there, uh, celebrating their 50th ship getting repaired in, in China. So they take the savings from that, and then they use it to fund lobbying efforts claiming we need the Jones Act to stave off China. Uh, you know, this is, this is the reality. Okay, so uh, we might get to more national security uh, arguments in the Q&A, but I want to go to Hawaii. So um, in Hawaii, Grassroot Institute of Hawaii did a study in 2020 that calculated the economic cost of the Jones Act. And it put that number at $1.2 billion per year, which is about $1,800 per family. And so we've put that out there. That number has been um, going around the world. It was just in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, in fact. And, um, and, but a lot of shipping proponents have criticized that number and said it's vastly overblown. Well, um, the, the study was done by an economist named um, John Dunham. And, uh, and so he has a lot of the economic arguments. How would you respond, though, to folks who said that, um, that costs or projections of the Jones Act in Hawaii are way, way overblown, and actually the Jones Act is minuscule? I mean, what we hear is that, okay, when it comes to shipping, the fuel cost would be the same whether it's a Jones Act shipped or not. Um, and that's a, that's a major cost factor in the in the trade. And so the Jones Act is only a tiny portion of the shipping cost. Um, so it's nothing to, to cry about. Um, what we know for sure is that Jones Act shipping is much more expensive than international shipping. I mean, it, it's inevitable. Uh, you take just the ships, the cost to build the ships. A Jones Act ship, uh, a Jones Act container ship, the type used to transport goods to Hawaii, costs about five times more than one built in a foreign country. Uh, Matson placed an order last month for new ships, three ships for a billion dollars. Those same ships overseas would cost more in the neighborhood of 60 to $70 million a piece. And now we're paying $330 million a piece. Well, who's paying for that? Uh, consumers. Um, then we have operating costs, crew costs. Uh, U.S. Uh, flagships, according to the U.S. Maritime Administration, are almost three times more expensive to operate than foreign ships. And then we just have very little competition. You know, here in, in Hawaii, you have Pesha and Matson to choose from. And there aren't just, the fleet is very small. As I said before, you know, 93 ships to, to meet the needs of the world's largest economy. You take ships that are expensive to build, expensive to operate, and few in number with limited competition, the inevitable result is expensive shipping, far above that what you would find internationally. So I, I, I just I guess I reject the notion that uh, there's some cost that, number one, we know it's more expensive, and now we're just splitting hairs over exactly how much more expensive. Well, is there some number we'd say, that's fine, that's acceptable, uh, uh, you know, the, the extra uh, cost is, that is, is, is uh, no big deal or something to dismiss. I, I looked actually on Matson's website. If you Google Matson car shipping, they say on their website, the starting price to send a car from the West Coast to Hawaii is $1,600. Uh, I don't think that's you know, anything to dismiss. And then if you want to send it to here in Maui, it's going to be even more. Uh, you know, uh, if you have a $16,000 car, that's 10% of the price right there. Okay, um, but... but um even the shipping co uh, companies, by the way, will uh, admit, yes, there is some cost to the Jones Act. So uh, they think it's small. And, but whatever it is, it's um, outbalanced. It's paid for because of the advantages of being a U.S. A US company. Matson has a dedicated port uh, on the West Coast. So you remember during the pandemic, there was a big shipping clog in in. Los Angeles, right? There were all these ships that couldn't get into the port, it, but except for Matson ships, which could get into the port because of that dedicated line. And so we, you know, had um, scares about toilet paper in Hawaii, but uh, we didn't have to be scared because of that. So how do you respond to that? My response is, Let's have competition. Let the best company win. If Matson offers an outstanding value proposition, they have outstanding reliability and uh, uh, cost-effective shipping, then they should have nothing to fear from competition. Um, I think that the people that are scared of competition are those that don't offer the best value. And I think it's very instructive in that regard that Matson and Pesha are so adamant in keeping the Jones Act in place. The Jones Act is a pointless law if it doesn't drive up costs. Remember? Because if they, these guys can prevail over foreign competition, why do we have the law? 
the entire law is premised on the idea is these guys can't compete, that they don't offer the best value. But uh, what about the argument about the dedicated port, though? I mean, um, Matson has one, but do the foreign shipping companies have dedicated ports, too? Or c- could they? I mean, there's nothing in the Jones Act that mandates you have to have a dedicated port. Uh, this is, you know, this is the fact they have one is outside of the Jones Act. And, you know, there, there's nothing in U.S. law preventing foreigners from setting up their own terminals as well. I see. Um, another argument in Hawaii, and this is, um, you know, I've talked to local ship shippers and freight forwarding companies, and they've given me this argument that um, Coke and Pepsi. So Coke and Pepsi at the store are about the same price. But um, the shipping cost, or how does that go? The shipping cost is is the same. So, um, but but the price at the store is different, or something. Basically, the argument goes that um, any savings would not be passed on to consumers. So, if the price to ship Pepsi were somehow more or something, um, then still at the, at the store, you'd still see them at the same price level. So there's no guarantee that, um, you know, the, the grocery store will pass on those savings to consumers. So how would you respond to that? One of the first laws in economics is that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Someone has to pay the piper, right? And we've already established that Jones Act shipping is more expensive than non-Jones Act shipping. That's something we know. And so these extra costs, what happens to them? Do we think that stores just say, I'm going to take less profit. That's how I'm going to respond to that. No, that's the last thing they're going to do. The entire reason for existence is to make a profit. These are not charities. So now it may not be that they raise prices. Maybe they reduce wages. You know, uh, they reduce costs somewhere else. They have to, but someone has to pay the price for that. Uh, you know, as far as the Coke and Pepsi example, yeah, I think the argument is that, um, one has higher shipping costs than the other, yet they're sold at roughly the same price. Therefore, we know that shipping doesn't really matter. But we don't know that because shipping is one part of the cost. Well, how much did the Coke and Pepsi cost before shipping is added on? We don't know that. We also know that stores, you know, my understanding is they look at profit from a holistic perspective. They don't look at every little product. Maybe they use Coke and Pepsi as a loss leader to drive traffic to the store, and then they raise prices on other goods. At the end of the day, they have to make a profit to stay in business. I see. So basically economics, right? You have to understand how economics work, not just Coke and Pepsi or something like that, right? Um, What about with warehouse space? So Hawaii um, only has so much warehouse space if we were to repeal the Jones Act or reform it somehow, now we're relying on foreign companies that have longer um, trade routes, and then we would need bigger warehouses, and we don't ha- have enough warehouse space. So we're relying on this sort of shuttle service that Matson or Pesha provide to LA that um, presumably the foreign companies couldn't. So how about that argument? So so I think the argument here is that, uh, yes, it costs more, but we get to save because we get more frequent service, so I don't need as much warehouse space. So I save on those costs, and in the end, I come out ahead. Well, if that's true, then again, why are you scared of competition? You have the best value. You have more frequent service. Then, uh, you know, I I don't understand uh, why they are so concerned with keeping out foreign competition. Um, yeah, it's just unclear. Let, let the free market decide who offers the best value. Madsen and Pesha tell us we have the best value. Well, that's what just words. That's rhetoric. Let's let the market decide. Let's open the competition and let's see who really has it. But um, for energy, you know, a lot of people say that um, energy to Hawaii is the, the, the ships bringing um, our oil to Hawaii and so forth. They're kind of like a pipeline. And that pipeline is owned by American companies right now. But if we were to change the Jones Act somehow, now our pipeline is owned by foreign companies. And isn't that a threat? I mean, to reliability? Well, I think your premise is wrong. In fact, the majority of energy brought to Hawaii is from foreign sources on foreign ships. So, yeah, you also hear this argument. We can't rely on foreign ships. Guess what? You're already reliant on foreign ships here in Hawaii. You go to the port of Honolulu right now, you'll find foreign ships in there. Um, so, you know, let's let's get rid of the notion that we can't rely on foreigners because that's already what we're doing. And I would think that if there were severe downsides and consequences from relying on these foreign shipping companies, that would have already been borne out and we would experience that. And so far, from what I can tell, that has not been the case. Okay, well, um, there's going to be more time for Q&A later. If you've got more questions specific to Hawaii, uh, 
Colin can answer, but I want to move finally to shipbuilding. So um, on shipbuilding, what we hear is we can't, we don't want these old rust buckets, creaky ships from that were built in foreign countries um, and to use in our trade. So, um, you know, what about that argument? The argument's almost, the, the reality is almost the reverse. You tend to find older ships in the Jones Act fleet rather than abroad. Um, and, and the reason is pretty obvious. We've made shipbuilding, uh, the acquisition of new ships, very expensive in this country. You know, I, I gave the Matson example, $330 million for a new ship versus you know, more than the neighborhood of $60 million overseas. You make ships very expensive to buy, people don't want to buy new ships. They want to hold on to the ones they have for a very long time. Um, a few years ago, the head of the U.S. Maritime Administration, Admiral Busby, was testifying before Congress, and they were talking about the age of what's called the Ready Reserve Force. These are government-owned sea lift ships. And he said, you know, these, these ships are like 45 years old. Uh, they're so old. Um, you know, in the international shipping market, it's very rare to find ships uh, older than 15 to 20 years. Not in Jones Act world. You know, I just mentioned that ship in Nantong is 40, is built in December 1980, still in service, and Pesha wants to keep it going for years to come, uh, as evidenced by putting in the, the, the new engine and whatnot. So, in fact, uh, U.S. shipping policy disincentivizes buying new, modern, more efficient ships. Uh, you know, other countries, they do subsidies to try to make their shipping cheaper. And here we kind of do the opposite. Let's make it artificially more expensive. Let's force you to pay, you know, five times the world cost for new ships. And that has obvious consequences for the efficiency and modernization of the fleet. Okay. Well, um, that's the arguments, but I want to talk about, um, collaboration. I mean, is there any room for, we hear repeal the Jones act, keep it in place at all costs, but isn't there something in the middle? uh, Isn't there some kind of reform that both sides might be able to work together on? What would you say? Yes, yeah, so uh, most times the Jones Act is presented in very binary fashion. Do we keep it? Do we get rid of it? I favor getting rid of it because you know my you know I see my job is to advocate for the ideal policy that I think we should aim towards. But kind of the good news here is there are a whole spectrum of options between full repeal and status quo. We could do things like um, right now, New England, winter's coming. They need liquefied natural gas. They can't buy American liquefied natural gas. Why not? There are no Jones Act compliant LNG tankers to ship it. So we can ship LNG to China. We can't send it to New England. We can't send it to Puerto Rico, parts of our own country, because there are no ships. Why not have a waiver system so you can say, hey, there's no American ship. I want to use the foreign ship. So that's, that's, you know, in the mainland in Puerto Rico, here in Hawaii, Hawaii uses uh, propane. The uh, United States is the world's leading exporter of propane. We can't send it to Hawaii. Why not? There are no ships. There are no ships capable of transporting liquefied petroleum gas. So Hawaii has to buy it from abroad, as far away as West Africa. That doesn't make any sense. That's not just hurting Hawaiians. That's, that's not even helping the U.S. maritime industry. If we were to allow foreign shipping in that instance, no one loses their job in the U.S. maritime industry because this is not a service they even offer. It's not in shipbuilding. We haven't built an LNG tanker in this country since 1980. Um, so but when that's it comes one, to reform, though, that, so. That's, so that's one kind of reform I think you know that would Im- improve matters. But another reform is you know talk about this U.S. built requirement. Um, this is bad commercially for uh, consumers. We have to pay more for ships. That means higher prices. So and it, just just to be clear, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the the ships, the U.S. ships, have to be built in America. They have to be mostly owned by Americans. They have to be mostly crewed by Americans and they have to fly the American flag. So the reform you're talking about is just the first plank I mentioned that they have to be built in America. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, Let Americans get access to foreign built ships at much less cost. My theory is cheaper ships means more ships. You make something more expensive, you get less of it. You make it cheaper, you get more of it. Uh, more ships from uh, a national security perspective, the thing the Jones Act is supposed to be about, I think that would be a good thing. Uh, it would be one argument if we had this vast shipbuilding um, base and lots of yards to support our military, but the Jones Act, we don't. Again, we're building you know three, three ships in an average year, you know, in recent years have been closer to, you know, zero or one. Um, so I think that would be, you know, one logical place to start. Uh, and again, these ships are mostly U.S. In many ways, these are foreign built ships already. 
Um, so it's and, not a big And if departure. we did that, let's say we did reform the shipbuilding so that um, U.S. companies could use foreign ships, foreign built ships in the Jones Act trade. What would happen? How would that change the market? How would that benefit us in any way? I think a few things. Uh, I think that if you had lower capital costs, it would, you know, we, we often talk about shipping in this country as purely something that affects the non-contiguous states and territories. And the mainland, we kind of ignore it, except for those places that don't have enough pipelines. They have to rely on Jones Act tankers. Well, if we had cheaper ships, maybe we could actually unlock some of that shipping and all the traffic on I-95 that goes, you know, along the East Coast. We could use shipping up and down the East Coast. Um, so I think there are opportunities to be uh, unlocked there, but also so uh, in the non-contiguous states and territories, we get more competition. Uh, some, something that sometimes goes underappreciated is that actually these shipping companies, they like the U.S. built requirement. They like the fact that these ships are so expensive. Why? Because it makes it so hard, it's so much harder to get in the game and to challenge them. If the going price for a new ship is $300 plus million, well, imagine you know how difficult that is to to start up a new company and challenge the established interests. When it comes to the airline industry, my understanding is that you know you can go out and uh, lease some used uh, planes and uh, fairly easily, relatively easily, start up a, a new airline to challenge people. You can't do that in Jones Act. Uh, so, Jones do you Act think industry. then that if if the Jones Act were reformed in that way, that we might see? Um, right now, we have two major shipping companies, Matson and Pesha. Would we see more? I don't know if we'd see more, but it would certainly put them on their toes because they would know there's the possibility of people jumping into the game if they're overcharging. Oh, so you're so saying I think just even, even if the they threat, didn't, the threat of competition, I think, would have value, you know, by itself. So even if they, even if there wasn't uh, a foreign entry into the market, we might see prices drop somehow. Or I, yes, I, I think that again, if there was a prospect of, you know, I I believe my understanding at least is that. Hawaiian Airways, uh, uh, airlines, uh, their prices have dropped since Southwest got in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, having the threat of other people jumping in, it keeps them on their toes. It keeps them, it forces them to be a bit honest uh, in, their, in their pricing and offer people the best value that they can get. So, I yeah, I, I think we would know that at, least, at the very least they weren't reaping exorbitant profits because, uh, you know, again, the, the threat of competition. Well, I want to um, move to a Q and A. If folks have questions or comments about the Jones Act, um, Sean Mitsui, our finance director, can come around with a microphone and you can pose your question. But uh, before we get to that, I want to ask one more thing that we've been wondering about this year is waivers. So, in Puerto Rico, there was a hurricane that hit the islands this year, and there was uh, well, maybe you can tell the story about that those waivers and. Um, and I'll ask a, a follow-up question to that story. Yeah, so in September, uh, Hurricane Fiona hit Puerto Rico, and the electrical power grid went down. And so people turned to, to generators. We need diesel to fuel those generators. And there was a company in Puerto Rico that uh, when this happened, they uh, contacted, I think, BP, and said, can you send us uh, some diesel fuel? Well, there was a tanker on its way from Texas to Europe, and it diverted itself to Puerto Rico. Um, full of 300,000 barrels of diesel fuel. Well, it sat there, but it couldn't offload the diesel fuel because this was not a Jones Act ship. And so a waiver request was submitted for this. And after some days, uh, it was finally granted. But this uh, uh, prompted a backlash from Congress, from leading uh, member, uh, committee members on the Transportation uh, Committee on the House and Senate, basically saying the waiver process was not properly followed, that uh, to do this, you first have to issue a survey, conduct a survey to determine if there are American ships that could have done this. And this waiver was granted after the ship already left port. Um, So I I think, you know, the waiver was granted because the optics here were terrible. You had a ship full of diesel fuel that Puerto Rico wanted and needed and couldn't offload. So eventually they granted the waiver. But actually, this morning, I read that Congress is preparing legislation right now to tighten that waiver process and make it more difficult uh, were that to happen again. So if, um, for example, there's a hurricane that was going to hit Hawaii, and let's say offshore, there was a cargo ship full of toilet paper, right? But it was a foreign ship, right? So would, would that ship or would we have to contact Congress for that to happen? 
Yes. I, I mean, as I read the law, the, if they're going to go by the letter of the law, I think it would be incredibly difficult to issue that waiver because waivers are supposed to be for national defense. That's the standard that has to be met. They say, you know, you can't just say there's an economic problem here. People need something. You have to claim it's for national defense. And there has to be a system where first the ship is in port. They say, I need to transport this here. It's for national defense. You make sure that there are no other American ships available. Um, so happily, you know, if, if, if Hawaii needs toilet paper and there happens to be a ship sailing by full of toilet paper, if you go by the letter of the law, you can't uh, administer or grant a waiver. So then it would be, but Congress can do it at once. So, you know, hopefully in this instance, Congress would ride to the rescue uh, and, and enable the good people of Hawaii to get the toilet paper. Congress would quickly pass a law. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But, okay, now pushing back on waivers, though, the proponents of the Jones Act say, well, the waivers don't really help that much. I mean, if Hawaii really needs toilet paper, it can ask Matson, and maybe in a day or two, it could bring it. Um, even the ones in Puerto Rico um, helped marginally, but not that much. So waivers are no big deal. Well, I just think in time of emergency, we need maximum flexibility and maximum options on the table. And the Jones Act takes away options. It makes more it introduces rigidity into the system. And I don't think that's good under any in most circumstances, but certainly not in an emergency situation. We need all hands on deck um, and maximum flexibility to re- effectively respond to a crisis. And the Jones Act just introduces restrictions and limitations on our ability to quickly respond to people's needs. All right, and make sure to keep that mic close to your <laughs> lips too. Um, I want to invite anyone to ask questions again if you'd like. Otherwise, I've got a whole list of questions. But um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We've got a question right here from Hugh Starr. Thank you very much. Uh, great Q and A. Very helpful. I, I'm curious. I, as I recall, uh, was it Representative or Senator Mike Lee from Senator, Utah yeah. or Wyoming, and was very supportive along with uh, Representative Case, um, it makes me wonder what other stakeholder groups or uh, interest groups in Washington are lobbying for keeping the Jones Act in place that have nothing to do with the issues that the outer territorial states are, are dealing with. So the, the, the primary uh, supporters of the Jones Act, the people that are in D.C. making the case for keeping this law in place, it's going to be the shipbuilders for obvious reasons. You know, the law says we have to buy what they make. Uh, it's the unions, the guys that crew these Jones Act ships. They're they're unionized. Uh, Masters, mates, and pilots union, Marine Engineers Beneficial Association, Seafarers International, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, it's the ship operators, Matson, Pesha. Um, they there are a number of <laughs> Here's here's the dynamic that we face. I can, off the top of my head, probably list literally like a dozen organizations that one of their top three priorities is maintain the Jones Act, if not number one. In fact, there's an organization called the American Maritime Partnership. Their sole reason for existence is maintaining the Jones Act. Uh, and on the flip side, I can't think of a single organization, a uh, lobbying group in Washington that their primary purpose or like a top three priority is getting rid of the Jones Act. So it, relatively speaking, it's a small industry and the losers far outnumber the winners when it comes to the Jones Act. But it's the classic case of concentrated uh, benefits and dispersed costs. Uh, the people that benefit, they, they, they view this as existential. This, this is the ball game for them. And they will do everything it takes to keep it in place. And a lot of people are hurt by it, but it's an annoyance. I don't like it, but, you know, is this going to single-handedly drive me out of business? Maybe not. Um, and so our, our, our politics reflect that. Our policies reflect that. So that's why I think Mike Lee has been unable to get more support for his position. And same thing with, with Representative Case. And if there's any other questions, otherwise I have a question. One thing I'll, I'll yeah. add on to that. Um, what's curious is I think in D.C., I think in the mainland, to the extent people think about the Jones Act, they think that's a Hawaii problem. That's an Alaska problem. And they think the dynamic that happens is that the politicians, the representatives from Hawaii and Alaska, they go to D.C. and they say, we need to do something about the Jones Act. Everyone says, yeah, we don't care about that. But it's even worse than that because we have two senators from Hawaii that support the Jones Act. They, ch- they actively cheerlead the Jones Act. Same thing in Alaska. And so it's a difficult conversation to have in Congress. You say, yeah, we should get rid of the Jones Act. And they say, I don't hear Hawaii complaining. I don't hear Alaska complaining. In fact, they love it. They, they vote for it. 
Um, Although the, so, the Maui County Council recently passed a resolution to reform the Jones Act, though. <laughs> and I do want to give Representative Case his due. Yeah, he has yeah. been out there making the, making the case uh, for, for the Jones Act, no pun mm-hmm. intended. Uh, but you need more of that. Well, I see two questioners over here, yeah. Hello, Nina um, My concern would be the standards that a foreign country would use to build our ships but just for safety reasons, how do we ensure that our ships will be as safe as those that are built on American soil? Because you get what you pay for, usually, you know, we're, we're taught. That's a great question. Um, so my response would be, number one, let's keep in mind that these are already, uh, in many ways, these are foreign ships. They take a foreign design. So not only the components, but the designs themselves are bought from Korean firms. And they will say, you know, here are our designs. And actually, we usually buy the older designs that they sell. They don't sell us their, their latest and greatest. And then we take their components and we do the assembly work. But what we have are something called classification societies. These are organizations that basically sign off on the ship and say, yes, everything is, is up to speed. Um, and they evaluate these ships. And you need to do that to get insurance. If you don't have someone signing off on this ship saying it's on the up and up, then you're not going to get insurance. You can't be in business. Furthermore, let's keep in mind that the U.S. Coast Guard has the ability uh, and the right to board these foreign ships and inspect them and make sure that everything is is okay. There's something called uh, the Paris uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, and it's a it does a, they do a ranking of different flag states. Um, so again, you know you have American flagships, you know ships from all over the world with different flags, and they rank them in terms of quality, basically saying, okay, um, it roughly corresponds to if we stop the ship, what are the odds we'll find something wrong? You know, And you have uh, and they call what they call the, the white list, the gray list, and the black list. A couple of years ago, the U.S. flag was on the gray list. Um, now, now it's on the white list, but you know who else is on the white list? Like Panama is on the white list. Uh, some of the biggest uh, you know, shipping... Um, organizations, uh, flags in the world are on that list. And the U.S. actually is, is, is pretty middling within that white list. There are a number of countries that are far higher than us. Um, so, yeah, and then it's just as far as shipbuilding, you know, they're all basically built to similar standards. Uh, there's not... It's kind of like when I screw something together from Ikea or something. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, and that's kind of the real injustice or one of the frustrating things about the Jones Act. We're paying more and getting less, or at least we're getting the same. There is no corresponding increase in quality. Um, in fact, you can make the opposite opposite argument that U.S. built ships are worse. We've, at least in the past, found evidence of that, and there's a good reason for it. I mentioned before, foreign shipyards, they might build 60 ships in a year, and Americans are building three. Well, who's getting more experience? Who's getting more expertise in that scenario? You know, who's doing more welding and more practice in that and making sure everything fits together tightly? Another question? Uh, I see a few. Go ahead. Uh, Valerie Lasher. Um, I'm concerned because this is a duality between the need for high, high paying jobs because we have a very, a very expensive economy and the desire for people and merchants to want to make more money by using inex- foreign ships and inexpensive and, and the lack of expense there. So there seems to be a sort of self serving lack of concern for Americans with good paying jobs and the maintenance of that particular level of um, com- commerce. I mean, if we really want to have a, a America that's functioning well, then we should be able to afford and we should encourage people to pay for that type of living rather than saying, well, we'll give everything to China. We can get this for two cents, this for four cents, that for five cents. And then China has the, um, takes care of everything. Then if anything happens between China and I, because we don't agree, we're stuck. Uh, so a few thoughts here. Th- thanks for the question. Um, number one, when we... Well, well, one reason we need good paying jobs is because everything's so expensive. Why is everything so expensive? Because of laws like this. Um, that's one thing I'd point out. Number two, when Americans save money, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't burn it. We take those savings and we spend those on other things that create jobs, create other American jobs. Uh, I think the Jones Act is properly thought of. It's a tax on domestic commerce. It's a tax on Americans doing business with other Americans. And that's not good for jobs. Um, you know, I, I used the example earlier of... Uh, 
New England, they have, they have to buy foreign LNG, even though we're the world's leading exporters of it. A few years ago, they imported natural gas. Most of it comes from Trinidad and Tobago, but they bought it from Russia. Uh, Puerto Rico, earlier this year, bought natural gas from Oman, halfway around the world. The Jones Act makes it more difficult to buy American products. How can that be good uh, for jobs? I look at this as uh, something that would unlock domestic supply chains and make it easier for Americans to trade and do business with each other. Right now, the Jones Act is kind of putting its thumb on the scale, saying, no, buy the imported product instead of the American product. Now, I I am not against imports whatsoever. I think imports play a valuable role in our economy, and they save us money. They contribute to our well-being. Um, but just from an efficiency perspective, why is the government doing this? Why should we put you know uh, Americans on the back foot when it comes to trade? We've seen examples. Uh, I think maybe I was talking with you or someone else uh, about this last night. Um, American lumber uh, companies that want to ship lumber to the rest of the country. Well, they're getting run over by their Canadians who get access. They, they get international shipping when they send to the U.S., whereas American firms have used Jones Act shipping, so they're losing market share to, to foreigners. So I, I, I think you, you get the point. I think this is ultimately a tax on American jobs. I don't think we make ourselves more prosperous by making things cost more. Do you think that there would be more American jobs if the Jones Act were repealed? Uh, or reformed. So, you it's know, it's hard to say, you know, uh, but yeah. Uh, economists, you know, we also like to talk. So basically bottom line, how many jobs does this create or lose or something like that? And the reality is when it comes to uh, trade, it's not as much about job creation. It's the quality of the jobs. And what we find with trade is freer trade. In this case, you know, opening up to shipping services, it leads to better jobs because we say, okay, um, for example, China, you guys go assemble the iPhones. And what we do is, we design the iPhones, the higher, you know, who makes more money, the guy stitching that iPhone together or the person that's writing software that makes that iPhone work? Well, that's the kind of jobs we have here in the U.S., and they have the assembly jobs over there in China. And that's what we find. You know, they take the lower value add. We move up the value chain. We get better jobs th through trade. It's interesting. Oh, I, I think I saw another question over here. Yes, is there an actual percentage figure number of how much more we pay being in Hawaii because of the Jones Act? Um, I, I know that uh, UH has come up with a figure of, uh, I believe it was 1% of the economy. <laughs> and now how do you, um, you know, whittle that down to like a price of milk or something? How many cents does that add to a price of milk? Um, we tried to slice that out in our economic study, but it's, um, you know, it's kind of like we treat Jones Act as if it were a tax and then try to calculate how much that tax would be. So, um, you know, in some cases, it's a few pennies, but those pennies add up to a big cost at the end of the day. So if you'd like to see that study, you can go to our website at grassrootinstitute.org. Uh, any other question? Yeah, another question over here. Way, way over here. Yeah. <laughs> My takeaway from this is that there seems to be a monopoly uh, in the aspect of uh, medicine. I hate to use uh, labels. So do you think or would you agree that there is such a monopoly uh, that's existed? There's a, a duopoly because there's Pesha. So there's two. Um, but that't not a lot, <laughs> so uh, we can it's safe to say there's very limited competition. yeah, I think it's safe to say uh, describe the Hawaii trade as a duopoly, and we find that all over the place uh, alaska it 's Matson and tote going to um, uh, Puerto Rico. There are two companies that have i think eighty five percent of the market, so this is something a recurring theme we find in Jones Act uh, markets. So, you know, my favorite uh, approach is repeal the Jones Act and basically, you know, throw open the doors and say, any shipping company from anywhere, um, you, can, you can serve the market. Uh, or, you know, as we mentioned earlier, one possi another possibility would be allow Americans to get access to foreign-built ships at much cheaper prices. And if they could do that, it'd be easier to start up a, a competitor and enter the market uh, with, with, you could even, not even buy, buy a new ship, you could go charter a used ship from the international market at even lower cost and, 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 and okay, uh, but try to challenge. There, there's something about that that sounds a bit scary, I guess I should say. Um, you know, a lot of people in Hawaii work for Matson, and um, that sounds scary to them. And also, um, 
Matson is a reliable friend of Hawaii, you might say. And if international companies came in, um, even if they compete with Matson, let's say they competed so well that they kicked Matson out. Well, now we have international companies doing our domestic trade and they may be fair weather friends. Let's say the, the market drops and suddenly it's not so profitable to service the Hawaii market. Well, off they go and, and now we don't have shipping. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a strong argument, I guess, um, against your position. You know, um, I buy a lot of my food from only two stores, uh, uh, Giant and, and, and Whole Foods. And if they were to go out of business, would I not be able to buy food anymore? You know, no, of course not. Someone else would step in that market and want to serve it. Hawaii is, is, is a market. Uh, shipping is notorious for how competitive it is and the low margins you typically find in this business. And if Matson or others went out of business... Absolutely, others would step in to fill the gap. And, you know, this isn't theoretical. We see this uh, over and over in any number of industries. When one person exits, someone else enters. If there's money to be made, people will rise to the occasion. I'll also point out, it's, it's useful to keep in mind that the U.S. Virgin Islands, they are exempt from the Jones Act. American Samoa is exempt from the Jones Act. Do they have problems with shipping reliability? Not that I've ever heard of. In fact, in the 1970s, I believe, there was an effort to subject the U.S. Virgin Islands to the Jones Act, and they fought it. They said, no way, we don't want any part of that. I think it's very instructive that the parts of the country that don't deal with the Jones Act have never uh, indicated any interest in being subjected to it. So what about an exemption for Hawaii or or Guam? Uh, Yes, absolutely. I think this would be another reform to start out and just say, okay, the the U.S. mainland, for example, the contiguous 48 states, well, we have options, right? I don't have to use a Jones Act ship. I can find ways around it. Hawaii, it's a different story. And those parts of the country that don't have alternative transportation options, it's worth granting exemptions to them. So do you think that Hawaii pays disproportionately then for the Jones Act? And We, we know this. Yeah. We know this. There are, I mentioned earlier there are 93 Jones Act ships. Um, I believe something, every single container ship in the Jones Act fleet, I want to say there's a neighborhood of 30 of them, they are 100% deployed in the non-contiguous trades. Right? There is no Jones Act container ship that runs up and down, again, the East Coast or the Gulf Coast. There's one ship that goes from Texas to Florida and then on to Puerto Rico. But without the non-contiguous trades, we basically wouldn't have Jones Act container ships. So we know that these parts of the country are funding those ships. They wouldn't exist without uh, the Jones Act. So we know they're, they're paying for it. So shouldn't they pay us then? I mean, like, what if, what if uh, we taxed other states to pay for the cost that Hawaii has to pay for the Jones Act? I mean, is that... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could do that. You could do that. It would just be... At least that would bring the cost out in the open. Not that for taxes, by the way. But, no, yeah. no, this is not something we're advocating. But, but uh, you know, at least if we saw that the rest of the country had to compensate Hawaii and the rest, we would see there's a dollar number assigned to the Jones Act. We say, this is the extra cost that is being assigned. Because right now, we're kind of fumbling in the dark. You know, one point I like to make make is that I think to have good policy, you need a sense of costs and benefits. And you weigh those against each other and say, yeah, that makes sense. Or no, that doesn't make sense. Well, how do we do that with the Jones Act? You know, how much does it cost? I mean, you guys put out a report. That's great. Um, but admittedly, you know, it's a report and it's not the, the, the last word on the topic. Um, so we're kind of guessing or you taking stabs at what, what the costs are and what are the benefits? Are we going to argue that absent the Jones, that there will be zero U.S. ships, zero mariners, zero shipbuilding? Um, so I, I just think we need to br- make these costs transparent and bring it out in the open. We're, we're kind of having this debate without all the facts, and that's frustrating. So uh, my final yes. question is, uh, would you think that component manufacturing, which is globally, but not just the trend, but it's the modality, uh, do you think it will open up shipbuilding as an industry? in the U.S. if we reform the Jones Act? I think um, shipbuilding in this country would look, it would would definitely look different. Uh, It's a complicated question because if you took away Jones Act, number one, what's driving shipbuilding in this country? It's it's actually not even the Jones Act. It's military shipbuilding. It's uh, building goods, uh, vessels for the Navy and the Coast Guard. And Uh, and that's protected by the Buy American Act? By the something called the Burns-Tolufsen Amendment. Um, And uh, yeah, I think there was a government report that came out last year that said that's like 79% of shipbuilding revenue is from military contracts. So, you know, it's possible that uh, they would just focus on that and say, you know what, this is my bread and butter anyway. And right now, these U.S. shipyards, they, uh, they build the occasional Jones Act ships. A lot of the biggest U.S. shipyards build nothing 
for the Jones Act. Uh, Newport News, they build, you know, aircraft carriers. They, they haven't built a commercial ship, I think, since the 1990s. Uh, Bath Ironworks, they haven't built uh, another major ship. They haven't built a commercial vessel in decades. Um, in fact, there are zero, zero U.S. shipyards that build combatant vessels for the Navy that also build commercial ships. Um, so we see a very little overlap. I think that uh, there would be a lot of focus on on military, but also I, I think that... Um, they would they would focus maybe on more specialized vessels, smaller vessels. This is what we see in Europe. Uh, they don't build big ships like they do in Asia. They tend to focus on things like uh, dredging vessels or ice breakers um, or high end shipping um, uh, vessels or uh, vessels that service the offshore oil industry. Things like that, kind of specialized high end vessels. And I think maybe that's an analog for where the U.S. might go. I just think that we are the world's most advanced economy. I think Americans are incredibly ingenious, inventive, and competitive people. And I just reject the notion that absent the Jones Act, Americans all kind of throw up their hands and go, we have nothing to offer this industry and, and walk away. Okay, well, I want to uh, wrap up. We'll, we'll have time for um, one more question back here. Um, and But basically, I wanted to ask what the future, I want to ask, what is the future that you project for the Jones Act? Is it here to stay forever and ever? Or do you think there is an inkling of an opportunity for reform or change? Uh, I'll give you the optimistic case for, for reform or change. And that's that um, the Jones Act is becoming, as time goes on, it's becoming more and more divorced from its goals. Uh, shipbuilding costs continue to escalate. Uh, the, the competitiveness of the U.S. fleet continues to fall. The size of the U.S. fleet continues to fall. Um, shipbuilding numbers are falling. By, by any reasonable metric, it's failing. And the costs, I, I think, are getting higher and higher. And we're getting into these absurd situations like New England might freeze this winter uh, in part because they can't get access to American uh, energy because they lack access to efficient shipping. Um, so I think the costs are becoming more apparent. It's becoming harder to defend. And we're seeing more people wake up to this uh, in Congress. You know, we mentioned Mike Lee. Um, we saw in, I think, September, eight members of Congress um, from the left uh, after the hurricane hit Puerto Rico, uh, called for a one-year waiver of the Jones Act for Puerto Rico, including AOC, you know, for example. Uh, we see Representative Case, we see uh, Representative Perry of, of uh, Pennsylvania. He introduced a bill earlier this year that would suspend or exempt LNG shipments from the Jones Act. Senator Cruz of Texas also introduced legislation to exempt it. So we're seeing more and more voices. If you look in the media, uh, you know, this year I saw uh, there was a New York Times column entirely devoted to the Jones Act and the cost of it. Business Insider had a 1,500-word uh, piece. They reached out to me to write all about the Jones Act. We're seeing, I think, more and more appetite and interest in this topic. So that's, that's I think, the case for optimism. All right. So, and uh, one last question here. Um, I think it was right back there. Yeah? Yeah. As I understand it, the Jones Act is supposed to protect American labor, basically. And without that, how much of American labor would be lost? Um, so if, if we want to make the assumption that absent the Jones Act, everyone working on an American ship loses their job, let's just use that as a hypothetical. Um, last I checked, there's around uh, mariners employed on ocean-going ships, those 93 ships I mentioned. A, a few years ago, uh, the number, there were about 3,400 Americans that worked on these ships, and that's back when there were 99 ships in the fleet. So I would assume the number is somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 Americans that work on these ships. Um, and my attitude is if we want to employ them, we think that's a valuable thing, then we should subsidize them and put them, make the cost transparent. You know, I mentioned the maritime security program earlier. If we think this is a profession that is needed we need Americans that we can rely on, then let's, let's subsidize them, um, and, and put these costs out in the open. And for shipbuilding? Shipbuilding um, the, is, is difficult because we have the entire shipbuilding industry. And I want to say last I checked, 110,000 jobs. But again, the vast majority of those, it's, defense, it's not commercial. Um, and then you take that roughly 20% of the revenues derived from the commercial side. Well, a lot of that is like barges and tugboats and smaller vessels. I think certainly on the barge side, actually Americans are reasonably competitive because they build hundreds of them per year. Uh, they have scale. And also then you have to factor in transport costs of moving, say, a barge from China to the U.S. So um, the numbers, well, 
I'll, I'll, I'll put it like this. Um, the Jones Act lobby, they released a report actually, um, several years ago. They claimed that the Jones Act creates 650,000 jobs. And they never explained how they got there. And one day I was uh, on the Shipbuilding Council of America's website, poking around as, as one does. And I found uh, they had they have an upcoming meeting and they had meeting materials and I downloaded them. I started looking through that and they had the executive summary of this report where they justified the 650,000. And they say they're actually, according to their own numbers, there are about 95,000 people that are directly employed in the Jones Act. This is shipbuilding. This is mariners. These are people that work for the shipping companies all together. So 95,000 uh, total uh, using their own numbers. So I assume that's an upper bound. We can assume, you know, it's not going to be higher than that. Um, and, you know, that's a big number, uh, you know, in a Hawaii context, in, a, in the context of the United States, 330 million people are, it's a, is a small uh, number. And I think, of course, we any any discussion of those numbers has to be weighed against how many jobs are we losing because of the Jones Act? How many jobs would exist without this law? You know, how many more jobs some, in the energy industry, for example? But some of the, and some of those jobs might not be lost, too, as you mentioned. In right. The, you know, we're talking worst case. I, I don't think that, you know, we go from 95,000 maritime jobs to zero. That that makes no sense to me. Um because the vast majority of these jobs aren't even exposed to foreign competition. Um, you know, guys that work on the Mississippi river, you know, we're not going to have no Jones act foreigners going up and down the Mississippi because there's still things like us tax laws, us immigration laws that they're all subject to. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for listening to this very wonky admittedly topic. Uh, but let's give Colin a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And now uh, you are all bona fide wonks on the Jones Act. So <laughs> now you can give this. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, again, I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassery Institute. Um, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can talk to Sean Mitsui there. Uh, thanks so much and aloha. <laughs> <laughs>